So we decided we should do a little practice question and as a warm-up and a wake-up exercise this morning. So if you please switch to the practice question. And we guarantee that your voting is anonymous and there is no way your employer will be able to track what you voted. <laughs> and so the question is, what was the best part of MIPM 2013? The meetings or the parties? I don't know if you expect me to, to sing while you vote, but maybe it's better if we don't have a bit of a cold and maybe I just, just won't sing this morning. But um, whenever, and don't think it through too hard. Great. The meetings, yes. <laughs> now, now, and then um, I should have asked for our students to uh, be uh, linked separately in the voting system so that we know what they answered. Um, but uh, no, it's OK. So, so let's get going then. We will start with uh, Maddie's uh, presentation. We'll share with us insight from AEW Europe's um, research on the global real estate market. Maddie. Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, uh, you know, it's been tricky coming here, and I think I share the votes that were there. It's a balanced view. You have to network and also um, collect information and, uh, and share views with, uh, you know, participants at, at MIPIM. Um, this presentation is on the global real estate outlook, um, and I'd like to thank my colleagues Mike Acton at Capital Management in Boston and uh, Glenn Nelson in Singapore, who actually um, have incorporated their, part of their views within this, uh, this broader presentation. I head up the, um, the research and strategy effort at AW uh, Europe, uh, focusing on, on, on the um, probably a, a tricky continent to be, uh, to be contemplating here today, as you'll see uh, in the next few minutes. So what I'll start to do, uh, Francois, is really give you a, a you know, global uh, picture, if we can advance the slides here. Yeah, and you know, I'll just stand up here to, to make it more lively. Uh, what I'd like to share with you is the view that investors today are looking at the, uh, the different continents in, um, in diversifying their portfolios. I think this is the most important and single most um, aspect that we've been hearing with uh, investors and uh, AW managers, uh, both direct as well as indirect investments throughout the globe. This is, uh, if you look at this, this map, I, I love this top type of approach. This is typically what the world looked like if you were to scale the countries, not by their geographies, but the, by their uh, value added or GDP to weight the, the country sizes. This is a view at uh, the back end of two, the 2000s of you know, what the world looked like if you were to weight the countries by their GDPs. And this is what happens in 2000, in 1990, so you know, a 30 year leap. And as you can see, Europe has, is still a very central stage here in terms of size comparable with uh, North America. And you see a growing uh, part in the uh, Eastern uh, and Asia Pacific region. And this is what you know, tomorrow will, uh, will probably uh, look like. And you know, this is, the, the trend here is really one where the balance between the, the regions is actually completely changing in terms of scale. It doesn't mean that this is a, uh, a proxy for investable universe. It doesn't mean this is where the products actually are and where you can actually deploy capital. The most liquid markets, and I'll come back to that in a second, are still in the, you know, the blue and, and pink regions. But the pink region is actually decreasing in relative size. And that's one of the key elements that we're seeing in, uh, in the world today. And I, and I think also what I find striking in this visual representation is how it gives us a sense of the size of what's happening in Asia yeah. relative to Brazil, for example, or Africa. Asia is really taking over the, and the whole the, map. This one is, is a forecast that dates back 2006, prior to the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that if this were updated, unfortunately, I didn't find a more recent update. But if this were to be updated today and the forecast for 2017, I'm pretty, su pretty sure the sizes would be even more in, in favor of the Asia Pacific region. So just to uh, you know, summarize, if I were to summarize in one f key phrase what's going on across the board when I share the views with, uh, with my colleagues uh, in, both in North America and, and Asia Pacific, you know, essentially, the, you know, the, it's a more upbeat sentiment in the US, you know, very, uh, very interesting developments out there. Um, Asia is, you know, my colleague was just actually waiting for something to happen. It didn't. 
the, the economies are recovering and even accelerating, with maybe one exception, which is China. You know, this, decelerating China is still 7% plus GDP growth, right? So it's still pretty much, you know, pulling the other countries uh, with itself. And then the question is, are we going to be sort of left behind? Is Europe going to be the laggard here? And for what reason? And this is where I'll, you know, probably the, the trickiest region and one where I'll spend a bit of time on. So just to, to give you a, a sense of where we are, this is GDP growth in the three you know, big regions, including uh, the light blue is the BRICS. It's not only Asia Pacific, it includes Brazil in here. And it's different percentage points with respect to long-term historical average. And as you can see, I think here the US, which is the red one, is already rebounding and is expected to be above trend you know, this year, at the end of this year, and then keep on accelerating and then softening its, uh, its uh, growth pattern uh, by the back end of the 2020. Uh, the BRICS are expected to, you know, they're still below their historical average, but that historical average has been, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty high. And they're expected to rebound even more strongly than what we're seeing in the US. And then the question, of course, is, you know, we're, we're going to lag. You know, Europe is going to, and the Eurozone in particular is going to lag. Uh, you know, pretty pretty consistently uh, with respect to its historical average. Uh, that's not really good news when you look forward and you're looking for income return and you're looking for capital growth, but it doesn't mean there are no, no opportunities, and I'll come back to that when I focus on the, on the regions in particular. So just a, a quick uh, sort of summary overview of uh, what, uh, what Mike uh, thinks about the, uh, the U.S. in particular. I mean, <laughs> you know, of course there's this key uncertainty, but um, I guess there's no real, you know, um, uh, option uh, than to actually find a compromise in the U.S. And I know there are a number of uh, U.S. citizens or people living in the U.S. today, and some compromise, and that's the key scenario that is being underwritten today, is that there, you know, there will be something agreed upon, even if it doesn't look like it's going to be the case uh, at this point in time, but this is what the e expectation is. So everything goes well, means the economy does not go back into recession this year and even accelerates. And the recent um, you know, statistics coming from the jobs market actually are pointing to, pointing to this direction. The Fed remains extraordinarily accommodative, uh, i.e. no changes until 2015. At least that's what they're, they've committed and pledged to, uh, to keep on doing. Um, and that actually bodes the question about interest rates and when do they rise and what happens if they rise and when they rise. And the U.S. housing sector recovery steadily accelerates, offsetting a you know, big part of the fiscal drag on the public sector. And you know, the, the key point is probably this one. Um, we've talked about a jobless recovery, um, probably a bit disappointing in the, in the past two years, but this seems to be turning, you know, turn, turning the corner. And we're going to, uh, uh, the question is, when will we reach this pre-recession level of total employment? And the, uh, the, the central scenario is next year. That's 2014. And U.S. remains safe haven for the global capital for the foreseeable future. And that's, uh, that means relatively cheap money for, uh, for the um, economic actors. Well, the rest of, of, of the slides actually shows you know, exactly what happens on each of these, uh, of these items. So how long until we, we're back into the peak? This is essentially the green line. It could be faster, could be slower, we could have some disappointments, but actually what, you know, what seems to be the pace today is really something that would look like uh, the, the green line. And that's you know, by the back end of 2014, we'll be at pre-recession levels for total employment. And that includes you know, participation rates, which are very high compared to other, uh, other countries in the world. And uh, one of the items, if you just drill down in the US, one of the striking points is we have an, uh, vacancy rates which are, for the commercial real estate sector, is relatively high. And that's, uh, that actually bodes the question, and I'll come back to this in a second, about net operating income. You know, how income producing are these asset classes or property types? The one that looks to have a pretty, a pretty uh, decent uh, vacancy rate is apartment, the apartment sector in the US. The other three, and uh, offices are part of that, that's the overall picture across the, the, uh, the, the country, are actually uh, 13, you know, nearly 13% to 15%. And the one sector, and that's unsurprising, that's a direct consequence of what we've seen in the previous slide, is that net operating income, you know, the cash flow generated by those properties, investment properties, are actually increasing or have been increasing and are accelerating throughout the, uh, 
the, the back end of 2007 up until now. That's not really the case when you look at the other property types. That's a key point today in looking forward. So there's an expectation that the recovery will actually feed into those, those figures and generate more cash flows. And it's, uh, this is the story about the US today. It's not really a question of capital growth. It's, also, it's essentially a question about income and, and yield. Yeah, and then of course the uh, one of the key uh, key aspects, and that's the last slide on the U.S. is about you know uh, thousands of you know housing starts that's beginning to pick up in this uh, in the single family as well as the multifamily sector, and the other expectation that that won't be derailed. That's the expectation today. Question on you know Asia Pacific. Um, this is this is the view of uh, uh, Glenn Nelson in a, based in Singapore, and what he essentially thinks is that. I think the first point to mention is you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe and, and the uh, central bank governor Kuroda actually pledging to uh, put more quantitative easing in the system and actually criticize the whole policy that's been going on for the past 20 years plus uh, in Japan. That's, you know, that's something to be seen. Um, looking forward to more inflation. And that's a key question about where, uh, where this is taking us. Probably not only on the interest rate, uh, uh, question, but also a question about foreign exchange rates, and the, uh, that's a, a, an, is, an essential element um, that we're, we're, you know, any multinational investor would certainly be weary of. You know, is are these policies going to sp stimulate inflation in the medium to longer term, and what's going to happen to exchange rates because that has a risk in it. So you, you wrapped up the U.S. part of your presentation without mentioning the risk of inflation. No, because not at this stage. we are not worried yet. No, I think it's essentially because if you look at where you know potential GDP is, you know, with the output gap, there's still a lot of slack, and where unemployment is today, um, even if there is an acceleration, we're not, you know, we're come back to this uh, when we talk about interest rates, essentially, and when and how the Fed will behave if the economy actually kickstarts and you know goes into the second and third gear faster than expected. But for the moment, this is not. You know, one of the key highlighting, uh, highlight points. Uh, you know, as you can see, maybe I'll just move on to the next slide for the sake of time to show you that you know, if you look at um, expected GDP growth in the key countries around the region, you know, China, as I said in the uh, you know, opening comments, is expected to slow. Uh, slowing means it's still be 7% plus. That's official statistics. Um, and Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, you know, the, the key economies in the, in, in the region are actually expected to even you know, see acceleration of their, uh, of their, of their growth rates uh, moving forward. And you know, the target countries which you know, AW is looking at at this point in time are actually uh, ones where our expectations of growth will be, uh, will be driving a lot of the returns. And, and the, maybe one aspect to mention here is that the component of return we're looking to in that region is essentially capital growth. So this is where we're actually focusing more on, you know, not, not just on core properties, but also on the value-added uh, properties, which actually have an, a, an important asset management aspect to them, um, be, when the reward would be capital growth. And that's quite important because, as we will see in this MIPM, we've started hearing a bit more about value-added strategies yes. compared to what we heard in the past. Right? For Europe or globally? Globally. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting to see how that will actually uh, be executed. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, I think that it's an important aspect to mention when we speak about Europe in particular. Uh, and this is also something we're discussing with clients, and uh, and uh, this is an aspect that you know has has some merit. You know, just um, you know, one of the questions, of course, and the key risks I haven't mentioned for the U.S. and I won't mention for Europe is actually the increase in you know. Supply, you know, is the, is the supply response something that's going to create problems in the future? So, if you look at those numbers, this is the percentage increase in size of the office markets in some of the key uh, key uh, metropolitan areas in the in the in the Asia region. Um, we're talking about numbers which are, you know, on average six to eight uh, percent. This is huge if you were to compare it to the U.S. You know the North American region or the European region. Uh, it's been on a declining, it's, it's expected to be on a declining trend moving forward. Uh, but we do have, you know, when you're talking about 10 to 12 percent, you know, addition to the existing stock, this is something that can disrupt your, your rental dynamics and, and, uh, and you know, the rental values of, of the properties you're, you're taking. So these are markets which are, you know, could be pretty volatile, rewarding, 
But uh, in essence, again, as I mentioned, capital growth is, is, the key, is the key point here. Do you think in those markets the global investor is protected because a lot of this increase in supply is really a shift from truly class B property sure. towards international standard type class A property? And so therefore scarcity is likely to remain for the top type of properties? Well, if you're talking about China, mm -hmm. that's probably that's certainly true. If we're talking about Hong Kong and Singapore, I think it is probably to it's, you know less true to a lesser extent. Uh, Korea is probably you know I, I I'm not that familiar with those, those markets, but you're right in saying we're looking at more efficient buildings, probably greener buildings, even in that region, uh, probably uh, buildings in which your your you know your efficiency you know the uh, number of uh, you know uh, employees you can have per square meter mm -hmm. uh, is actually uh, more efficient than what you, you used to so the equation works better for the uh, for the, the end user mm -hmm. um, and this is probably uh, uh, one of the areas where we're interested in in those in those particular markets and i would also include uh, japan which is not you know mentioned here mm -hmm. that's that's also one of the topics so you know the outlook for the short term in that region. I mean, I had difficulty convincing that there were my colleagues that there were you know some some key risks. So we did. So this is the sort of more positive and upbeat um, element to the market short term. You know elements and from if you look at the economic metrics are pretty positive and and upbeat. There was a sentiment that the region in Asia could actually be uh, you know uh, have knock-on effects which would be very disruptive after the you know, great financial crisis and Europe uh, as a key client of the region, um, you know, sort of scaling down its consumption and import patterns. It doesn't seem to be happening. So there is a more upbeat sentiment in the region and locals are more tolerant towards risk and actual risk taking that I was mentioning a moment er earlier. However, there are a number of, uh, of risks to be, you know, be taken on board. Inflation, commodity prices may rise as local demand um, is, uh, increases, energy and food. Political um, and new leaders and various pressure points are actually still, still there. And the, you know, the lagged impact of um, very low interest rates. So in the markets where you accelerate your construction pattern and your new supply, and the availability and cost of debt capital is, is, is cheap and, and abundant, then you know, there is this risk of going into a cycle in which you have oversupply. So this is one of the, you know, key uh, key points to bear to bear in mind. And you know, probably in the no negotiations, and uh, uh, you know, you have uh, overly optimistic vendors and price in pricing expectations. You know, excess corporate capacity is also a risk here. So let me focus now on the probably the most tricky region, the one we're standing here we're here today. And um, I have to say, if we were to summarize what happened. Last year, I can tell you that you know last MIPIM, if you were here, I guess that you know people wanted to talk about you know more positive sentiment, but we were just after a um, two LTROs in January, December and January last year. There was a key question about Greece, key questions about you know the peripherals. I think you've heard less of those to, uh, this year. Uh, I think we've uh, you know we've we've you know made a step forward into actually pushing back the, you know, the events of a major disruption within the Eurozone. But it, that comes with one caveat, which is the crisis is probably going to last longer. Uh, and we have to live with that, and we have to you know, incorporate that within our business plans. And it's linked to this, whatever it takes. It's the draggy plan or the draggy bluff, essentially telling us that uh, you know, we're, there is going to be, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, capacity to keep this Eurozone together. So I think in his keynote, Jürgen Stark was a bit pessimistic and maybe he was arguing the reason we don't talk about it is yeah. because we just got tired of talking about it. Yeah, there is. Not necessarily because <laughs> there is this is element, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this, uh, obviously there is this element. Um, however, you know, the, yeah, there's, I don't know if you have read the papers, I think it was about a week ago, in which um, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, uh, of Luxembourg actually said, you know, if Europe actually, if the Eurozone breaks up, then there, there is a risk of war. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. actually, um, I think you mentioned it last year, that one of the you know, specificities of this system, Eurozone system, was that it was only the only integration between countries that was voluntary mm -hmm. in, in Europe's history. So, you know, whatever it takes to keep this together, and we, we're, we're seeing, uh, and just as, a, as an anecdote, whatever it takes is also what the new Bank of Japan um, um, uh, governor actually uh, mentioned about his 
future policies to actually kickstart the, the Japanese economy. So we're hearing more of those three words uh, across the globe. Just um, uh, to run quickly here, what we have done for clients, actually international clients looking at Europe, uh, because this was so complex, because the risks are so you know, volatile and the situation is so uh, uh, mobile, that what, we have, what we've done here is we've taken a look backwards and a look forwards. This is a tentative scoring of the uh, European Union countries, and we've ranked them uh, based on their macroeconomic strength. It's both based on the key metrics of you know, unemployment, consumption, uh, GDP growth, etc. And this is out of, out of a score of, of, uh, of 30. So no one actually scores very highly. However, you do have some, you know, some outstanding, you know, outliers here. You know, Germany, Norway, uh, Switzerland, Denmark. You know, the the, the northern European countries actually score relatively higher. This, these are relative scores to say, you know, countries uh, like Portugal, Greece, uh, Slovenia, uh, etc. And then we've added real estate strength, which we gave a, a, a stronger weight in our in our scoring. This is essentially a question of liquidity international investors you know, in the market, um, a question of transparency, you know, how these markets actually uh, uh, behave and where, what their features are. And you know, if you were to stop here, you'd say Germany is clearly you know, the, the, key, uh, the, key, uh, the key country here. And, and you know, that's not surprising. And this is actually what I think is coming out of this MIPIM too. Mm -hmm. Germany is one of the top and favorite investment destinations. It doesn't mean it's easy to execute. It just means that this is where, you know, the perception of where the, the capital wants to flow. The UK, despite you know, risk of recession, uh, actually is a second. And, you know, France as well as Austria. Uh, Austria being attractive, but a relatively small market. And then we've added forecasts, you know, total return forecasts and, you know, the going in yields uh, within those markets. And this is what we get. And, you know, the, the top three are, you know, unsurprising. However, there is a gap between the top two and France, and then there is a whole group of countries which are actually are relatively attractive, and then, of course, the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the economies uh, go down. The interesting thing is that if you map this, this is what you get. And uh, the, you have scores which actually uh, outperform the, uh, the, uh, the other countries, and you do see the, uh, the, the uh, northern European countries being, uh, being relatively attractive, and I think Sorry, I some think, of the I colors. Think, yeah, some of the colors actually. Got, I think uh, it's a French screen. It distorted the color of France and made it look nicer. <laughs> yeah, if I if you, you move back, you see the screen here. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. relatively tricky to get everyone yeah, here. Yeah, right? no. <laughs> France was not meant to look so good. <laughs> yeah, if if I look, if yeah, maybe someone tweaked the numbers for France because we're in Cannes, right? <laughs> what happens is if you look back at this this picture, France actually is just in between this top two and the sort of the, this whole group of countries which actually have relatively similar scores. And France has become so, some sort of a pivot within this uh, European framework. And you know, everyone is actually the, probably the, the country which has attracted the most comment and commentary about its economy, economic policy. And this will give the direction of where Europe is going in the future. And I think this is where there's quite a bit of uncertainty with the current government. Absolutely. Uh, in yeah. terms of what's going to be the direction that they choose for the country. And then what we are saying from here is that it could have a major impact on Ex the whole rest of the region. Exactly, yes. because it's all about how do you stimulate growth without tapping into your budget deficit versus how much of austerity do you want to impose on, your, on, you know, on the economy. And France, is ex this is exactly what's happening. So you have an incoming government. Well, it actually nearly has a, a year into, uh, into, into office. And, you know, they really have, they're really at the crossroads today. And, you know, look at what happens in France, because that will give you the key to where the rest of the economies will be able to say, hey, they're doing it, so we should be doing it too. Um, I think the, the most important feature of this region is debt. Uh, we, you've, you've heard about the funding gap. I'm not going to you know, dwell on it. I just want to show you this, this, this graph, which I think is pretty much telling about the situation. This is the UK, and this is net lending to property in the UK, dated back to 1980. So you have a you know, pretty long period of time. And the red line is capital value growth, as measured by IPD with UK property. 
So as you can see, there is a striking correlation between the two, right? Net lending um, from different sources of capital, but essentially banks up, up until now, and capital growth. So the two are inter intertwined. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know which one actually causes the other. There, there, there's a correlation between the two. And it's interesting to see whether it's the capital growth that you know, attracts more debt capital, or at some point in time, if it's the debt capital that actually overstimulates capital growth. So this is you know, essentially the driving factor of where we are seeing capital growth in the region. Um, just quickly, this map is actually the volume of investments in the different countries in Europe. And despite the colors being <laughs> tweaked a little bit in the previous graph with the country scorings, mm -hmm. there's a close overlap between how much capital a country has attracted and how uh, our scores for these countries have, have come up. And again, um, th this is not scaled by the sizes of the country, but clearly the, you know, the most liquid and country in here is actually uh, uh, the United Kingdom uh, with 41.4 billion euros uh, invested last year, followed by Germany with 25 and 16.9 for, for France. And, and I think it is worth pointing out the scale. I hope you can all see the numbers. The difference between the 41 billion in, in Great Britain and 1.7 in Spain or 2.5 in Italy, yeah. and the Nordics being between one and nine. Exactly. And, and Turkey looks pink, but it's so far still pretty minimal. It's half, half a billion. Half a billion. Uh, those numbers are, you know, trying to capture the whole story. There are a number of, of deals that are not captured here, but it gives you a very clear picture that not only this is an attractive or has been perceived as an attractive, but it's also a very liquid market. And it's, it's a question of, you know, how often do assets trade? Just to give you an example, in France, if you want to buy a shopping center, it's very, very difficult. You know, most shopping centers are held within investors and listed property companies. They're not trading. In the UK, these assets are trading. So it's a very, you know, the market pricing is, is very reflective of where the, the situation is. And just, just bear in mind, 80 million invested in Portugal, 1.7 billion only in the whole of Spain, as measured by this. That's, you know, dramatically low. So, um, uh, just I'll just maybe skip that one and, and move to the to the to the next theme for the sake of time. Uh, the consequences of what I've just told you about the discrepancies between the markets is actually, and this is an example in the UK, there is one of a key theme in Europe, and it's it's expanding across the continent. It started in the UK. The discrepancy between what's perceived as prime, that's uh, you know offices, retail some parts of the logistics market and industrial market, which is long leased secure income, that has compressed significantly across the globe and is being perceived as pretty pricey today, and all the rest. The rest being either properties that are not well leased or have a risk on the covenant strength of the tenant, or located outside the southeast of the UK, for the sake of this example. And we're now at a yield gap, which is measured by the blue uh, surface here, which is you know, unprecedented. So uh, this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something that is expanding across Europe. And I'll show you the numbers here for mm -hmm. just the, the case of the average European office yields. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the red line, follow the red line. And it's mm -hmm. been relatively conti you know, continuously going upwards on an upward trend. So there is a yield gap that is being created between the prime mm -hmm. and the secondary assets, as well as uh, uh, and, and that's not only the case for offices or retail mm -hmm. or logistics, it is and, the case and, across the board. Yeah, and, and that is probably why we are hearing in this MIPAM quite a bit more interest to move away from or to move beyond core, because now the pricing is becoming attractive. Yeah, yeah. and you know, this is a pan-European uh, series. Mm -hmm. If you were to go you know, drill deeper into some of the markets, you would find even more striking differences. So uh, does that mean there's, there's just no interest in any property that doesn't have a 9 to 10, 12 year lease. I'm not sure of that. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll just tell you, if you look forward to 2013, look at the Italian uh, you know, election and maybe the re-election that may happen in the, in the, in the, next, uh, the next six months or so. Uh, Germany's election is gonna be a key and pivot event. Follow that, you know, how, will Angela Merkel be re-elected or not? What will be the themes discussed in Germany? Because those will be, you know, the major themes going forward in Europe that will shape Europe in the future. Um, 
Inflation again, interest rates uh, are the uh, probably the, the themes we really want to uh, to, uh, to to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe um, sorry, I'll, I'll just go forward and and um, we'll talk about uh, you know, opportunities in the opportunistic tech segment. Yes. And so, as Maddie mentioned, this interest rate and inflation question is a critical question as we look forward. And so, we thought we would ask you about it. And if you want to put up the the question here, then I guess I'll. I'll stand up now. Um, so the question for you, oh, and before the interest rate, I'm sorry, we wanted to ask you about, let's ask about the negative now so we can switch to the positive later. If there were to be another negative economic or financial surprise in 2013, where do you think it would uh, come from? So once again, it's once a green light is on and it is on right now, we invite you to vote one, two, or three. Is it okay? Yeah, you should keep people should keep voting. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. So when your green light is on, push one, two, or three. Okay. And so, so Madi, you are very convincing, I guess. <laughs> I think this the situation tells you, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, yeah, to uh, to see where things. I think it's essentially political uh -huh. uh, backlash. Yeah. You know, the you know people vote, and when they're unhappy, they actually vote away mm -hmm. governments. So that's happened systematically yeah. in Europe. So the consequences are very difficult to mm -hmm. actually fathom and and uh, and forecast. And maybe our luck right now is that every once in a while they get a chance to vote for a comic, rather than an extreme right candidate. And so so far we have held um, the political situation okay, but but comics can run countries. Um, it also then, say, sorry, Francois, but it also tells you that maybe this is where opportunities will lie, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, if, if uncertainty is at that level, okay. I think this is. Well, I think our, our view is that this is where you can actually, um, you know, in, in critical situations, this is where you can actually have great opportunities. And maybe that's all, all connect to another theme that we have heard about the importance of local talent and understanding exactly what you're betting on in this world of uncertainty. So we had a second question for you. Is, um, it's this big question about when is inflation going to kick in, when the interest rate environment going to change? And so when do you expect the current low interest rate environment to end? 14, 15, and 2016 or beyond? And this is, this is a global, you know, it's global, not, no yeah, region yeah. in particular, no, no. right? In general, yeah. Now that I'm standing, if I'm not singing, I could dance, but I don't think that would be good either. So just vote. <laughs> Interesting. Here we go. So, so um, I think we're okay for now, right? Does that match? It seems so. Yeah. Seems so. Yeah. Interesting. Too. Yeah, but maybe uh, 2016 and beyond is a bit. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, where's beyond? You know, where are we going? 2017 or? Uh -huh. Okay. It's going to be interesting to see how, how real estate investors adjust the maturity on their debt commitments and, and see how we navigate that as a, as a, as a whole. There was actually a, a slide you skipped about how real estate can help us get protected against inflation or not, and I think your colleagues have some questions about that. Yeah. Um, if we, I think if we move back to the presentation, I think it's just, uh, it's just after. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think well, I'll share with that. you, this is a work that my colleague Mike Acton did, uh, did uh, in the U.S., and I think it, because of the advance in the cycle, you know, the U.S. is actually, in our, in our opinion, you know, more advanced in the cycle, particularly with respect to quantitative easing and, and uh, you know, interest rate risk. This is a question we get from many investors, you know, what happens if interest rates go up? I think this, and why? I think simply, and I'm borrowing this, uh, probably some of you have seen this, but your your conviction, <laughs> your conviction is that this is going to be keeping going on and on and on uh -huh. in the Bank of Japan, in central, in Bank of England, ECB, the Fed will just continue you know pumping money into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Go Both in, <laughs> okay, you want to be on the receiving side, right, of this. <laughs> so in order not to um, sort of uh, distract you too much, I'll just move on. So it has to stop sometime, right? 
And the expectation, I think that from our uh, friends at Moody'sEconomy.com, the expectation is that this will start, you know, begin to, uh, to happen at the back end of 2014, and then that will creep up into the other, the other parts of the, uh, of, the, of the yield curve. And um, you know, so essentially, if you believe that this is going to happen at the back end mm -hmm. of 2015, or 14, sorry, and, and then the, the consequence will be on the longer dated bonds, then the question is what happens to real estate yields? You know, they have to respond to that. Um, the inherent question here is, mm -hmm. do we have inflation to back this up? Um, and maybe so just the, go, the go to that, that table. Sorry, yeah, yeah exactly. That, that, so we, yeah. I just, just yeah. want to point out to mm -hmm. this, these curves are the forecasts for you know, cap rates for property by property type in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll have a similar sort of picture across the globe, maybe with a, mm -hmm. with a one or two year, you know, uh, uh, after effect, mm -hmm. and if I go to the table, this is a, this is an interesting table because it tells you if you know how much net operating income growth you need to offset everything else, sort of staying the same. How much do you need your income to grow to compensate for an increase in the cap rate, depending on where you start with the cap rate? So just you know, bear with me. Start with five percent yield. So this is sort of a property you bought in two thousand thirteen. And moving forward, you've had a good streak of, of, of income and capital growth in the next two, three years. And then you know, interest rates start to go up. And as you've seen, they've gone up by 100, 150 basis points, sort of just normalizing. Um, and that means that maybe your cap rates have to move up, say, by one full percentage point, just to reflect going back to historical averages. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you need your net operating income to increase by 20% just to compensate for that yield decompression. Of course, that may happen over a period of three years. So roughly, you would need 6% a year. If it's four years, then you know, you're, you're more at ease with compensating for that. But this is something that really a lot of investors have in mind, and um, th That's it's been discussed. Number. Sorry? That 20% is a big number. It's a big number. Uh, I focused on that one. You know, some, you know, the risk averse would try to look at the mm -hmm. right-hand side of this table or you know, the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, the risk prone would sort of be more optimistic and say, yeah, you know, property is a real asset. It has inflation protection, so it will be on the safe side on the upper part of this table. So this is where the discussion is actually mm -hmm. happening. I'll take the clicker. Please. Thank you. And then we'll switch to um, what we heard from you. The comment I would make is who needs to pay Moody's for forecasts when you just have a few people at MIPM with clickers, and I think it's just about the same. And, and just as good, you guys were dead on. Um, if I could have my part of the presentation, uh, please, on the screen. So what did we hear from you? And the big message is the one at the top. It's Last year we talked about cautious optimism and this year is beyond cautious. And maybe that's a sign for caution and I'll get back to it. Why is it that we characterize the sentiment this year as beyond cautious optimism? Um, the first, because that's what you told us. And we ask participants, what is your perspective on your real estate market compared to the same time last year? And two thirds are more optimistic now than they were same time last year. There's always at MEPAM a few grumpy people who are unhappy about what's happening here. Maybe it's related to the party, maybe it's related to the region they come from. But by and large, more than two-thirds of the people felt more optimistic this year than they were last year at the same time. Now, why is this greater optimism? And it's, we thought we were not going to use this word again. This is a word, an expression that was familiar in 07 or 08. It's this wall of money that is still there and looking for uh, yield and looking for real estate investments. Um, the allocations to real estate within big institutional investors and many more investors have only continued to go up from the 5% allocation to the mid-teens allocation. There's still plenty of money to be allocated. There are very few alternatives to real estate in terms of uh, de generating yield, in particular in the current environment. And then the green shoots that Mali talked about, signs of recovery in economies around the world, again, trickier within Europe, and, and rooms for pessimism within Europe, in particular certain uh, countries. So that, that's the theme for why is optimism, is that it's looking good for real estate. Um, how are people actually executing or 
approaching this uh, deployment of the wall of money, well, we asked participants, how is your business activity this quarter compared to the same quarter last year? And for more than, or for half of the participants, it's actually better. So this optimism is backed by real activity uh, within the MIPM participants. Um, how do we see people deploying the money? Or what do we hear from the different summits and presentation here? There's definitely still very much emphasis on direct control of the property. We hear a lot of people talking about having the right partner. We hear about alignment, we hear about trust. And that is probably a legacy of what happened during the crisis. When we thought we were in this together and realized that when things turned sour, we were not aligned anymore and that created um, problems. Primarily, we hear about equity investment, even if some specific firms at MIPM were, I think, pushing for more debt investments, in part because the banks are not there, in particular in Europe, to pick up um, the funding of uh, debt, and in part because it's trying to expand the scope of real estate investment into um, making real estate a bit of a replacement for fixed income uh, strategies. For now, we're actually hearing those strategies being pushed but then the investors being reluctant. Um, we haven't heard of pension funds shifting some of their fixed income strategies into real estate yet, even though some real estate investors would love for this to, to happen. So still some caution in how uh, capital is deployed within real estate. We ask, is it now the time to invest beyond core safe real estate assets? And overwhelmingly, people said yes. I think this correlates very well with the research Mandy presented about this uh, gap that has opened. There is definitely a sentiment that core assets have become overpriced or at least become very um, pricey. And compared to a year ago, our sustainability issues becoming less important, more important, or about the same importance. I think this, this goes back to a theme we approach quickly. It's about is there obsolescence in the existing real estate park that actually is opening new avenues for investment to create new spaces. And this is where there's a very interesting interplay between various participants here, the investors, the end users, the cities, and the architect. And maybe one of the benefits of this wall of money that's coming into the sector is that those participants, those actors, are create, creating great spaces for us to live in and for us to uh, uh, work in. And so we do hear this year again that there's more emphasis into uh, sustainability issues than there were in the past. So, yeah. Also, if I could just jump in here, you know, when you talk about sustainability today, mm -hmm. it's something that is mandatory, uh, mm -hmm. I think, in, in yeah. many of the investments, uh, you know, anything that is development or new mm -hmm. or refurbishing, restructuring yeah. has to have, you know, mm -hmm. you know, has to tick all the boxes. And it's also a question that um, enables you to have a better and more sustained dialogue with the tenants. Uh -huh. that's, that's, that's the experience I've seen happening over uh -huh. the past uh, three, four years, because in the crisis, Suddenly, this criteria, you know, maybe was not, you know, the top of the list mm -hmm. anymore. And mm -hmm. then it, it it came back fairly mm -hmm. quickly, essentially because it was, um, as you said, places to live, shop, and mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and and work. And this is one of the importance that we're seeing within the, you know, the leases, the green leases, mm -hmm. and the relationship with the tenants. Mm -hmm. Instead of just having someone in, and then okay, mm -hmm. we'll see you guys in three to five years, right? Uh -huh. Great. So so. I talked about the why, I talked about the how. What are people investing in is this core plus. And, and I, I think we used to joke about core plus as not being a serious concept. I, I hear it much more serious now. It's really about trying to understand beyond the major cities. Where are their core assets? I might have not have noticed before because they are in secondary cities, because they are in some of the emerging markets. And trying to understand that when I look at the assets specifically, I can try to have a better sense of who are the tenants, what are the lease structure, what is the local economy doing. And therefore, I might be able to find core type assets in markets that I hadn't looked at uh, before. So core plus is not in the sense that I've, I'm, I'm withdrawing my standards or changing my standards, it says that I'm going to be much more focused now in trying to find strategies that remain core, but in markets which were not the first markets I would have thought about. Um, as many mentioned, sustainability being a big factor. I think sustainability, my impression is every year I come to MIPM, the definition of sustainability broadens, right? And it definitely includes design, it definitely includes the, the setting within the overall metropolitan area, the connectivity with the rest of the country and the, and the global economy. And really, a lot of focus on local fundamentals, as I've just been uh, saying. Of course, the, the difficulty is the uncertainties. 
uncertainties that come in large part because there is one thing we know, is that we are not in an environment where a big wave is going to make all the boats rise. And therefore, my strategy is going to be successful because I understand the local conditions of my particular asset. That makes it much more difficult to execute than if I'm in an environment where global growth is just going to carry the day, no matter what I, no matter what I do. And so, when we reflect upon what we hear this year, on the one hand, you hear a real premium to local talent, right? the call for alignment and trust, for local competence, for local strategies. But then the question I ask is, is do we have enough talent to actually deliver as an industry this ability to keep control and to have such local strategies? And it's OK to, to say and to talk about the one deal I did here and the one deal I did there. But in particular, when we meet with institutional investors or major pension funds that have billions to manage around the world and they have a staff of three, right? the sustainability of this local focus strategies just doesn't seem to work with three people managing billions at once. So if that's the case, then, then is this great for our students? Um, is this an industry that's about to hire a lot? And, and, and you know, there's also a bit of um, truth in the answers. If you're optimistic and you're doing activity, are you actually going to hire um, uh, this year? And, and this is nice to see, two thirds of the participants telling us that their company has plans to hire in real estate for the, for the coming year. So I take that as a very strong sign of positive news. Um, we did go back to that interest rate question, because I think this is really one of the big questions hanging over the industry. Is concern about the eventual rise in interest rate a significant factor in your real estate decisions? And so even if we think it's not for until 2016, that is a concern that is on people's mind. So, sorry if yeah. I could just jump in. I mean, if you think nothing will really happen until 2014, mm -hmm. two, uh, sorry, 2016, mm -hmm. yeah, fine. But, you know, this is to be thought of in relation to how liquid mm -hmm. the asset class is. So if you're investing in something that's very liquid or parts mm -hmm. of the market which are very liquid, mm -hmm. then maybe you have the option to, you know, to move out if yeah. you think the timing is right. But if you're investing in, in markets which are less liquid and you think this is not a problem today, mm -hmm. 2016 is just tomorrow. Yeah, so this, think... is, this is one of the key, I think, points that you know, you know, investors will, you know, have in mind and, mm -hmm. and should have in mind. To an exit and also from the way they're probably going to structure the deals, right? Because those, those trucks are going to affect the liquidity itself. And, and we'll talk about that actually in a, exactly. in, a, in a second. Let me take a detour and tell you about our conversations with the cities and regions that were here at uh, uh, MIPM. Um, there is a sense in which the conversation this year was exactly the same as the conversation last year, um, except just a little bit more emphasis. I think it's interesting over the many years I've been here at MIPM to see how cities have moved to fundamentally understand how their role is to support the success of the private sector, that the way forward is a partnership with the private sector. That comes out very loud and clear from the political leaders who come here at, at MIPM. There's a very strong understanding the importance of having a good culture and sustainability within your city. I think this is being driven by the fact that everyone is trying to attract this young creative class because everyone thinks that those entrepreneurs are the ones who are going to create the jobs uh, for the future. And in particular, because cities understand that that young creative class is willing to move into downtown type areas. So it's a major force for rejuvenation and renewal of a, of a city. Maybe the biggest theme that we heard from cities this year, and with much more emphasis than in the past, is infrastructure. And again, I think it comes from a clear understanding by the politician that infrastructure is a major driver of their local economy. And that is really one place where, as political leaders, they can provide coordination and efforts in support of the success of the private sector. Just one question hanging, listening to all this conversation, is have we set up ourselves to make decisions at the right scale? And you know, there's just a little concern about all these cities competing with one another for economic activities, but not forgetting they are all part of regions, they are all part of countries. Some of them are part of the European Union. And when we think about this competition happening across locations, are we mindful about the externalities we impose on one another with our particular uh, investment plans? And it's striking that lots of conversation here take place at the city level, but often cities are part of regions that also matter from an economic point of view. So just, just a question. 
why would you consider the biggest impediment to investment in your city or regions? These are questions we asked to a um, city and regions representative and local economic fundamentals being the, the biggest answer. Again, moving towards those strategies that are focused on, on local conditions. We asked them what competitive advantage did you emphasize here at MIPM to make your city attractive um, to investors? And I would point out um, if you had up infrastructure and, and location, that becomes a pretty significant uh, number as to what they are trying to promote here. So, in conclusion, I guess the, the main worry as an academic and outside observer is um, are we about to forget the lessons from the boom and bust we just went through? And, and there's an interesting way to think about how, how we switch our emphasis during the cycle in real estate from the, the real estate expert to the deal junkies, the financial engineers, and then back to the real estate experts. And I think we are still in that real estate expert phase, although we're starting to see green shoots here and there of, of the... <coughs> my American colleague here is nodding his head because he's very scared about what he sees happening in CMBS market. And so, so are we... You know, I think Madi was telling me that they are trying to be very careful at AEW to make sure the real estate guys at the investment committee are still heard, right? And that it's not the finance guys who take over yeah. from, from the conversation. Of course, uh, I mean, at some point you, um, you invested a property and you have no guarantee that you'll be able to liquidate when mm -hmm. you think it's, this is the right time to mm -hmm. do it. And that's a, fa you know, that's a factor of the, 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 the real estate's characteristic, mm -hmm. uh, it's a function of you know, how happy is the tenant mm -hmm. in there if, if the financial strength of the tenant is working yeah. uh, and you know, how flexible the building is if mm -hmm. it's a, an office building or you know, a logistics asset or, mm -hmm. or a retail. Mm -hmm. And if you hear everyone around the table, then mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're better positioned to, take the right, you know, to make the right decision, including if you're going to put debt on the property. Uh, the finance mm -hmm. uh, people and you know what maturity you're you're actually um, mm -hmm. uh, aiming at, because that implicitly has an exit uh, implied mm -hmm. into the into the, the structuring. And so for now, we hear about this local talent and really f focusing on the decision making at the local level, and and this is great. But as I mentioned before, this is not sustainable for an industry which needs to deploy and manage so much capital, unless you're going to hire a lot more more people. And so the question is how, you know, we were in this fun space and then we all got mad at one another and we went into direct investment and now we are starting to see JVs coming back, understanding that we can't all be doing direct investment, it's too cumbersome. And from JVs, we are going back towards club and the question is, are we going to go back towards funds? And, and I think this is where I think Madi makes a very good point. There is this trade-off between finding the right partner and being in a liquid environment. I think he was reminding me yesterday that whenever I buy shares on the stock market, I actually never ask myself who else bought the shares with me, right? And, and why is that? It's because I can sell tomorrow whenever I want to. And, and, and so right now, we are moving into this space where we feel more comfortable because we'll have direct control and we'll only be with partners that we know, right? But it's not clear this is better than just being in an environment where maybe I don't know so much who is with me, but I can sell when I want to. And I think it's a very important point this trade-off and this tension between you know, having the right partner in tiny and heavy structures and being more indifferent, who am I with, but more efficient in combining money, but being in a structure where I can exit um, more easily. And I think it's what's going to be interesting looking forward to next year to think about then once we go to this, go back to the funds, so I could have done a, a circle. <coughs> Sorry, does this look different than what it was in the boom and, and how have those funds providers and fund managers adjusted to the lesson that, that, that we learned. So we thought we would conclude by first uh, telling you how people told us MIPM changed their, their outlook. Like I mentioned, there's always a few grumpy who had a bad time here and it snowed this morning. Um, but for the most part, people are leaving here feeling the same or feeling more optimistic and that's always good to see. Um, and we wanted to finish by asking you a, a question. And, and, and really, that, I think that's a question we want to ask and, and remind ourselves next year how we feel about it. And how would you characterize the current real estate investment trend during this economic recovery that we see? Do you feel we are on a healthy path? Do you feel there's so much uncertainty that you don't want to call it yet? Or are you feeling from what you see around you that we are planting the seeds for the next crisis?
And you should enjoy this last vote because I'm being reminded from the back. It's very important you realize you're not supposed to take those clickers home. They will not work. <laughs> So one, two, or three. Still a lot of uncertainty on what's going to happen. And so the only answer to this is let's all come back next year and figure it out. <laughs> and, and remember, those of you who are late, those parties are just as important as those conferences. But we really appreciate you coming here this morning with us. So thank you very much. I think we have a bit of time for, for questions. I was just uh, I was I was struck by the um, um, the investment volumes that were that were shown by the different uh, different countries. What would uh, what would Spain, for example, have been in 06, 07? We were closer to you know between six and eight billion. Uh, so that's you know that's eightfold uh, compared to what we have seen here. And the other feature is that at that time, you know, 06, 07, the percentage of international capital targeting Spain uh, was, you know, was the vast majority. And today, you know, for the, you know, one point something billion, it's essentially trades between Spanish investors and even, you know, high net worth individuals. Thank you. Maybe one thing I, I should just add is the, um, uh, there's a slide uh, I haven't shown, which is the, the degree of, you know, in, you know cross or pan-regional capital and uh, e Europe's volumes last year kept up relatively well, essentially thanks to large sovereign wealth funds targeting the key cities of London, Paris, and some, um, some cities in Germany. Uh, and that's, that's, that's an important thing to bear in mind because you know, if you have a bad surprise somewhere in you know, a region outside Europe, you know, how's that capital going to behave within that environment? And also, I think you mentioned significant investments out of the Middle East, for example, carrying the day for France. Absolutely. Right? I mean, they, um, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the Qatar Sovereign Wealth Fund, you know, bought some very, very um, uh, important, you know, half billion or even more uh, deals in, um, in, you know, in some of the, the, the hearts of Paris uh, of assets. And that, that's just one out of maybe, you know, half a dozen or more uh, sovereign wealth funds targeting, you know, the prime assets in London, in Paris, um, in, in Munich, and Berlin, etc. So one last question in one minute and seven seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what do you see for Las Vegas, Nevada, and the US? And we just had Gentry from the, uh, Asia buy the Stardust site um, for $500, $500 million. Yeah. And our operators are also going around the world now buying gambling sites. We're going into Madrid, mm -hmm. Sheldon Adelson is. So, so g gambling seems to be uh, taking off and um, I'm not going to make express a viewpoint on this. Um, I think the best thing could happen for Las Vegas is that we think about organizing this type of MIPIM conference right there. Well, Sheldon Adelson <laughs> has been trying to buy MIPIM who was with Comdex oh. who owns the Venetian and, and Palazzo and he said it needs a different venue. And he would like to probably bring it to Madrid when he opens there, or Singapore, well, so or back to Vegas. I'm not sure we are authorized to uh, uh, talk on this issue right is this, now. <laughs> is this linked to the weather in some way? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It does not snow in Las Vegas, I guess. But, but for now, we have enjoyed being in Cannes. We have enjoyed being with you. Thank you so much for uh, coming this morning. And please do remember the clickers in the back of the room. Thank, Thank you. you.